Nottingham. I got a first class degree in neuroscience in 2001. And then I went on to do uh, doctoral studies. I scanned lots of brains using functional magnetic resonance imaging. Resonancia magnetica, I think is how you say it. Um, and uh, I got my doctorate in 2005. Then I went out to Germany to the Max Planck Institute to do some postdoctoral research, again with uh, MRI. And my interest then was how does the visual brain interact with the auditory brain to, pr to create the audiovisual world that we live in. I was interested in the senses. But then, by that point, I'd got very frustrated. The last time I scanned a brain was in 2009. So for the last 12 years, I've been doing something completely different. Because I kept reading stuff in the neuroscience literature that I realized was very useful for me in my everyday life. And quite often, neuroscientists are interested in finding out new knowledge to put into the books of neuroscience. And there didn't seem to be anyone who was taking the stuff that was relevant to daily life and just spreading it to everyone. So that's what I now do. Uh, I spent many years when people said, so what do you do for a living? I'm a neuroscientist. So what do you research? Well, I don't do research anymore. It took me a long time to sort of work out who I was, if you like. And so what I do now is uh, neuroscience ABC. A is for author. Uh, that's my first book, Sort Your Brain Out. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about that in a moment. B is for broadcaster. Um, I've, I've presented many TV shows, mostly on UK channels, BBC and ITV, Channel 4, but also a little bit of Discovery, and uh, most recently on a channel called Insight TV. So there are two series of Secrets of the Brain, which is definitely my best work so far, 21-hour shows, uh, and you can either stream it on insight.tv, or if you have a, a Samsung smart television, I discovered the other day that you get lots of channels for free, and one of them's Insight. So, because it was shot in 4K, it's still, still being shown perhaps too much for some people. And then the C bit is for consultancy. I, I take this neuroscience stuff and I go on big stages like this, often in front of uh, business people, uh, also science festivals. But this is the bit where I kind of try and help people do better with the business of their own brains. And so, over the next 50 minutes, I'm going to basically do what I call uh, a science of sin bop sandwich. So, the science of sin is the uh, middle bit, that's the meat in the sandwich. And then the bops, which are brain optimization principles, that's the, the bread either side. We're gonna start and finish with a couple of bops which can help you get your brain working better every day. So, some of these brain optimization principles are relevant to the sort of morning time, some of them to the afternoon time. So I'm gonna start with the BOPs, the brain optimization principles, most relevant to uh, two times a day. Once in the middle of the night, when you should be sound asleep, and once uh, partway through the morning. So we're going to start here. It's around about four in the morning. I want you to give me a show of hands. How many of you see this on a regular basis? Two, three, four in the morning. You can't get back to sleep. You're trying and trying and trying, and you're wide awake in the middle of the night. Anyone? Okay, that's good. I suspect there's more of you than that, but I've done this talk all over the world, right? And every time, it doesn't matter whether the audience is teachers or engineers or financiers, more than half of the audience always put their hand up. It's very, very common. So if it happens to you, you're not alone. Now, what do you do typically if you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep again? I'm sorry, this is the audience interaction part. Those people who put their hand up, someone shout out, what, what do you do? Read, okay, someone else? Go on your phone, brilliant. Well, ladies and gentlemen, those two things are the wrong thing to do. You know what you should do? Go and clean the oven. If you're the type of person who likes cleaning the oven, don't clean the oven. Do whatever household chore is that you hate the most. Now, it's, it's very easy to, to, to do what you did. I'm not criticizing you. Again, that's a very typical answer. Reading or doing something on your smartphone because Quite frankly, you're annoyed, right? You're, you're, you're frustrated that you can't get back to sleep again. You think, what can I do? What can I do? The last thing you think to do is something unpleasant. But that's actually what you should do. Because you're accidentally incentivizing your unconscious brain when you go through the sleep cycles, dream sleep, deep sleep, dream sleep, deep sleep. We always wake up multiple times through the night. But usually, we go back down again into deep sleep before we realize we're awake. If you reward yourself by reading something nice, 
by playing a game or looking at social media on your phone, you're actually accidentally incentivizing your unconscious brain to make you come fully consciously awake in the night. And then when that happens, you start to worry. It's very natural you start to worry. If you punish yourself, and I, and I mean literally get out of bed, go down and clean the oven, it's amazing. You'll feel really, really sleepy, but you've got to keep, keep forcing yourself to keep going. And once you've endured a certain degree of unpleasantness, you've sent a very clear message to your unconscious brain. If you wake me up in the middle of the night, you will be punished. Now, why is this important? This is important because if you remember one thing from my talk and you forget everything else, this is the most important thing. We should be getting eight hours sleep a night. Now, I know most people don't get that, and if you're only getting five or six hours, don't panic. The aim is, every month, try and increase the amount of sleep you get by 15 minutes. Increase the amount of time you make available for sleeping by 15 minutes. So if you're getting six hours sleep a night in October, then in November, you should be aiming for six hours and 15 minutes. In December, six hours and 30. And slowly but surely, you can get more sleep. Now, the reason is, it's overnight that our brain does the repair and maintenance work. It's where the, 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 the roadways through our brain, the, the messages are sent down at 250 miles per hour. They are literally repaired. If you're only getting six, five, four hours sleep a night, you're getting less of that repair work done. So it's very important to try and get to that eight hour period again. It's also at night that you get your memories are, are consolidated. They go from being temporary memories to, f to permanent full-time memories. It actively searches through what happened to you in the daytime to memorize in the long term only the most important memories. And it's also the time at night where your brain essentially washes itself. It actually removes the toxins that build up over the course of each day. And if you're only getting six hours sleep, then you won't be removing as many of those toxins as if you're getting seven hours and seven hours as if you're getting eight hours. So that is why sleep is so important. And, and a part of this washing process is also to do with memory. Specifically, when you revisit those memories of unpleasant social, reaction, um, social interactions, when you think back to that, it makes you feel anxious. But overnight, when you're sleeping, your brain goes back to those unpleasant social things, perhaps when you were socially slighted or left out of something, insulted, and you can think back to that and learn from it without it making you feel bad. So sleeping for longer each night, not beyond eight hours, but eight hours, can actually help you in your daily waking life feel less anxious. Okay, that's bop number one. Bop number two is all about our favorite bean. We are a caffeine nation, a caffeine world. A um, little bit of fun, can anyone find Bruce Willis's head amongst the beans? Action movie hero from the 90s. Where is it? Top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. There he is, hiding amongst the beans. So the story of co coffee is very confusing, right? On the one hand, you hear that it's good for you. On the other hand, you hear that it's bad for you. Well, the fact is, it's both. So on the one hand, here's a data point. If you uh, drink coffee, two to five cups of coffee is considered a moderate dose. Every day of your adult life, middle age, when you get into the post-retirement years, you, will, you are likely to get Alzheimer's and uh, or, or uh, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's 10 years later than people who don't drink coffee at all. So there's something about the coffee bean that offers a neuroprotective effect. We're not sure exactly what bit of it. It's full of antioxidants, so that could be part of it. But thinking of the previous bop, as we all know, caffeine is a stimulant. As we may not know, the half-life of caffeine is six hours. What's a half-life? A half-life is the amount of time it takes to reduce the concentration in your bloodstream by half. So what that means is, if you've drunk a load of coffee over the course of the morning, and by midday, you've got four cups of coffee in your bloodstream, it means that six hours later, at 6 p.m., you still have two cups of coffee worth in your bloodstream. Six hours after that, that concentration has gone down to one full cup of coffee in your system at midnight. So I know that socially, conventionally, people drink coffee all through the afternoon. At the end of a meal, in the evening, what does the waiter say or waitress? Would you like a coffee? And people routinely take it. This is insane. 
for, for, for the health of your brain, this is absolutely ridiculous because a lot of people say, hey, it's fine. I drink coffee every night before I go to bed. I fall off to sleep, no problem. But do you stay asleep for eight hours? So th my advice to you is drink coffee by all means because it does have a neuroprotective effect. It looks after your brain. But make sure you get all of your coffee drinking done in the morning. In the afternoon, switch to tea, something with less caffeine in it. Black tea has 15%, one five of the caffeine, and green tea has 5% uh, of the caffeine in it compared to one cup of coffee. So that's my advice to you, two bops to start with. And now we're gonna move on to the science of sin. So the science of sin, I must admit I myself am not religious. I don't believe in God, I don't believe in the devil, heaven or hell, because I am an evidence-based human being. However, I thought long and hard about this, and we humans all have tendencies to do things which annoy people around us. And the concept of sin, whilst religious thinkers thought of it in terms of if you sin, then you're going to go to hell in the afterlife. If you don't sin, you'll go to heaven. This is not actually too bad a thing. Even if you're not religious, it's a good thing to consider this, because religious or not, there is something to be said for sin, because as you will learn in the next, well, half an hour apparently I've only got, which seems unfair, it's supposed to be 50 minutes, <laughs> um, that there is uh, really good evidence to show that we have this conflict in our brain, where on the one side, we've got the angel telling us, be virtuous, do good things, things that help everyone around you. And then on the other side, we've got the devil saying, nah, screw everyone else, you're much more important, look after your own interests, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. Now, whilst theologians thought of this taking place in the sort of cosmos, I think of this entire story taking place within the brain, which is why we have to start at the very beginning. Some brain basics so that you can understand how this works. So, this is a picture of how most people think about how their brain works if they haven't had uh, studied the brain specifically. Uh, this is from a comic that I used to love when I was a child. It's called The Numbskulls. And you've got Blinky behind the eyes doing the seeing. You've got Brainy at the back of the head doing the thinking, presumably. Now, this idea of functional specialization, that different parts of the brain are responsible for doing different things, that's actually not too far from the truth. But the truth is that the light that hits the back of our eyes is converted into electrical information, which then travels to the back of our brain. It's the back, the rearmost 20% of our entire brain is primarily responsible for analyzing that information, analyzing the color and the motion and the shapes to produce our sense of vision. When it comes to brainy, here at the back, the, uh, the brains, if you like, the clever part of the brain that enables us to do all the things that we can do that our non-human primate cousins like chimpanzees and bonobos can't do, well, that's all thanks to expansion of the prefrontal cortex. About 350 to 100,000 years ago, our ancestors started getting a bigger and bigger brain, and much more of that extra brain territory was behind the front of the, of the head, uh, the prefrontal cortex, which is why we have such big spans, such big foreheads compared to others. So this idea of uh, functional specialization, it's actually surprisingly close to the truth. There's much more overlap as in the front, the front area does many different things, the back area does mainly vision, but as a basic principle, it's not too bad. In terms of what the brain looks like, it's much more like this. This is not an artistic impression of the human brain, this is actually a scan taken with magnetic resonance imaging, but where the focus is on the structure, and specifically this is revealing the white matter. So, you might have heard of gray matter and white matter. The white matter are the neurons, the brain cells. It's, it's the brain wire. It's the cabling that your brain consists of. And as you can see, it connects the, the fr the, sorry, this is the, the front of the brain, and that's the back of the brain. And this cabling basically enables all of the outer surface of the brain, which is where the gray matter is, where these neurons interface and create a synapse. The gray matter can communicate front to back via this white matter traveling through the middle. It all travels through the thalamus in corticothalamocortical -thal loops. So there are 86 billion brain wires in your, in your head, 86 billion. And every single one of those brain wires is connected to thousands of others. So there are trillions of connections in your brain, which means 
that there are more connections in your brain than there are stars in our galaxy. So the next time you look up at the Milky Way on a clear night with no light pollution, and you can see the Milky Way, our galaxy, in all its glory, you'll notice that there are so many stars that it looks like a cloud. It's really blurry. You can't see the individual pinpricks of light because there are so many stars in the galaxy. But there are more connections in your brain, which I think is truly astonishing. But that's not even the best bit. The best bit is this concept called neuroplasticity. So there's a real sense that adults, adult brains don't change very much. Kids, you can see that they change. Young kids change from month to month. Older kids, they change from year to year. You can see the change in their abilities, in their skills, in their ability to interact with the world and think about the world. But in adulthood, it feels like from one year to the next, we stay more or less the same. So surely our brains are fixed. But that is absolutely not true. So the concept of neuroplasticity is all about the fact that practice makes perfect, right? We know that, but do we know why? Well, practice actually increases the number of synapses in the pathway that's being used in that, sk in that skill. That leads to faster, more efficient communication between brain areas. So the next time you come to do that behavior, you can do it a little bit better. So in this case, it's a very old and tried example, playing a musical instrument. If you regularly, intensely, and keep it up over long periods of time, practice something like the piano, it will change the structure of your brain. And we know this because if you scan the brains of professional musicians and you scan the brains of amateur musicians and you compare the structure of the two types of brain, you find that the part of the brain that controls finger movements is physically larger in the professionals. But now, of course, that's not absolutely clear evidence because it could be that the professionals always had a larger area representing finger movements in the motor cortex. It didn't necessarily become that way. So that's why the next study is really important. So where I did my uh, brain scanning during my doctorate at Queen Square, um, they scanned a load of uh, drivers of London's famous taxi drive, London's famous, London's famous black cabs. And, uh, and they, they scanned them before they did this exam called the knowledge and after. So they scanned them about two years apart. And the knowledge requires them to memorize every single major route within 10 mile radius of central London. So there are 25,000 different routes that they have to be able, without looking at a, 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 a smartphone or a sat nav, without looking at a map, they have to have memorized the route. So if you say, how do you get from Hyde Park to Buckingham Palace? They have to say, well, I'd go down Piccadilly, and then I'd go down, actually, that's a really easy route. But <laughs> not only do they have to remember, be able to explain the route they take, they also have to memorize 20,000 different landmarks. All the major hotels, the museums, the parks, where the, the, that someone might want to go to. So it's an incredible feat of memory. Comparing these same people before and after they complete the knowledge, they found physical structural changes in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus uh, is here. This is a human hippocampus on the left. And as you can see, it looks very similar to um, a seahorse. And indeed, hippocampus means seahorse in Latin. It's the tail part of the hippocampus which becomes physically larger in the brains of those taxi drivers. And incidentally, it's a case of use it or lose it. When they were scanned in later studies after they'd retired, it shrunk back down to within the normal levels that any of us who haven't done the knowledge would, would exhibit in our own brains. So this was really strong proof that the environment that we regularly interact with, and specifically the way we interact with those environments, can physically shape our brains. But then we humans are really unusual compared to other creatures because we also shape our environments. We shape our physical environments. We shape our virtual environments. And if we're regularly, intensively interacting with these environments over long periods of time, that too can change the shape of our brains and change our abilities. So environments shape brains, and brains shape environments, which then shape the brains, which then shape the environments, around and around we go. So what this means is, essentially, we have some choice over our brains. If we can choose the environments we immerse ourselves in, and we can choose what we do in those environments, we can, we can try and make sure that our brains change in a way that helps us. Now, this isn't a talk for today, but there's some evidence, early evidence, that the virtual world, you know, this idea that every time there's a spare second, people pull out their phone and start mucking around. 
This could have lots of long-term negative impacts in the long run. We're measuring them at the moment, we don't know for sure, but it looks like it affects people's ability to focus on one thing for long periods of time. It looks like it has an impact on our ability to do empathy, to feel how other people are feeling, because we've spent our whole lives looking at facial expressions and body language, and a variety of other things. But that's a different talk. The talk here is about the science of sin. You might be wondering when I'm gonna to get to the point. Well, it's coming very soon. This is an environment that I, as an atheist, spent an awful lot of time in as a child. When I was at primary school, I went to a Church of England school, which meant every morning we had a religious assembly, which meant we got together uh, early in the morning and sang hymns together, religious hymns. I really enjoyed singing. And I said to my mum, I want to join a choir. And she said, well, there's a church at the bottom of the road. Go and join their choir. I was like, but mom, I don't believe in God. I can't, I can't join a church choir. Like, that would be dishonest. That would be bad, right? <laughs> and she said, no, don't worry. Just go down, do the audition, and then if it means so much to you, then admit to them that you don't believe in God and see what happens. So the Church of England is, is very um, kind of open-minded, and I did this. I passed the audition. I said, I don't actually believe in God. And then the head choir master said, well, hmm, that's a bit awkward, but don't worry about it. Just... Don't say amen at the end of the hymns, at the end of the prayers. And so I've been doing that ever since. So my primary school we, it was a Christian, you know, religious school. Not, not, not heavy on religion, religion light. So was my secondary school. So from the age of 5 to 18, I sang lots of hymns in lots of choirs. I even sang in St. Paul's Cathedral once. And I loved it. I really enjoyed that feeling of, of being together with other people, joining your voices, and creating amazing sounds in an amazingly beautiful place, you know, with big echoey ceilings. And, 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 and then I started thinking, well, this is amazing. Look, look, at, look at the kind of, you know, if, at the moment, we're, we're a very technologically rich world. But if you go back 100 years, 1,000 years, these were the places where the most exciting experiences in people's lives happened. There, there was beautiful art on the walls that could start a story. You could say, you know, who are these three guys over here? And then the vicar or priest could explain to you the story of the three kings visiting Jesus Christ when he was born in Bethlehem. Um, and so it's a place of music, it's a place of light, and this is an environment that can influence people's brains. And I realized uh, that in adulthood, even though I was actively kind of averse to the stories of religion, and I thought it was all nonsense, my moral framework was nonetheless very Christian. When I judge the difference between good and bad, the difference between the right and wrong thing to do, it was very much in line with Christian thinking on the whole. There were certain things that weren't quite in line with it, but on the whole. So I thought, isn't that interesting? I actively, consciously refuted and rejected these ideas, yet I believe them anyway. So why? You know why. Because of neuroplasticity. Being regularly, intensively immersed in that world, it changed my thinking, and maybe it did you too. You might still believe now. You might not. Either way, that's great as far as I'm concerned. I'm not here to change your thinking in any way. Just maybe to make you think differently. I don't want to change your beliefs, but I just want you to see your beliefs perhaps in a different way. So, um, I spent a lot of time in Hyde Park. Have any of you visited London? Have you ever been to London? You know, you know Speaker's Corner in one corner of Hyde Park? It's right over near Marble Arch. And um, I'm, I love roller skating. I roller skate up and down by the Hyde, Hyde Park uh, Lake called the Serpentine. And when I get tired, I'd always go to Speaker's Corner, which is a place in London where anyone can stand up on a box or a ladder and, and talk to the crowd about anything they want. It's a place where you can exercise your freedom of speech. And I would go down there regularly, like in the, in the spring, summer months, maybe autumn. I'd be down there like, you know, two or three weeks, weekends every single month. So I regularly went past and listened to these people. And they were invariably talking about religion. 95% of the people who go down there talk about religion. And I thought, no one's talking about science. I need to fix this. So I thought it would be nice if I go down and start talking about my story. And my story is that I'm, I'm open to some of the ideas and religions, but I feel like as a scientist, there's other information that has come along since those books were written that sort of suggests that some of what's in those books is wrong. Like, given what the tools available for working out what's going on in the world at the time, thousands of years ago when these books were written, they did an amazing job of studying 
humans and looking at how people's life choices could lead to good outcomes for them and some life choices could lead to bad things. And so a lot of the stories in books of religion are trying to give you the principle that you can apply to your own life. <laughs> She's cute, that little girl, isn't she? Um, um, those principles that you can apply to your life, it's not necessarily suggesting you should take everything literally. So, you know, I tested some of my ideas with these people, and it turns out, as you can see, the crowd grew and grew, as this crowd has grown and grown. You know, people are open to it, even if they're really religious. And a lot of these people, they are fervently religious, and they're really, like, arguing about, no, my religion is better than your religion. There's Muslims, there's Hindus, there's, actually, the Hindus tend to be quite relaxed. There's, a, <laughs> it's basically Muslims and Christians largely arguing about who's, who's got the best religion. Um, but they were actually open to some of these ideas. So I thought, brilliant, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into it more deeply. Deeply. And what I was trying to do was work out what's the difference, you know, we've got this phrase in English, I don't know if it translates into Portuguese, but you don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, once you finish washing the baby, you don't want the baby to go down the plug. You just want the bathwater, the dirty water to go down the plug. And I was like, well, what's a fair way of working out which bit is the baby, the bit we need to hold on to in religion, and which bit is the bathwater, the bit that's perhaps was very useful hundreds of years ago, but is perhaps less useful now in steering and governing a good life. So I decided to use the lens of science to re-examine some religious concepts. And I was looking for evidence. I'm, I'm, you know, since the, we have the scientific method, you can come up with a theory, you can test that hypothesis, and if you have enough ed evidence, you can keep the hypothesis, and if there's no evidence, then you have to reject the hypothesis. And so using this process of looking for actual evidence, I could find no evidence to support the supernatural stuff. Stuff like heaven and hell, stuff like, you know, God and the devil. I, I still to this day have found no evidence to suggest that any of this is true. I think it was a useful, uh, a useful white lie in the past, but I think so, now that nobody, so many people don't believe it anymore, it, it, it's lost its use in some way. So I personally think, and if you disagree with me, that's fine, that the supernatural stuff can go down the drain. But the religions are still the best at doing certain things. For example, building communities. If you have a building dedicated to a religion where anyone can walk in there to learn more about that religion, and if you turn up on a weekly basis, whether it's a temple or a synagogue or a church or whatever, you can feel, you can gain a membership of a community just by going there regularly, you know? Because when you go there regularly, people recognize you, go, oh, hi, it's you again. So you get a bit of social interaction. And you can feel like you belong over the course of weeks and months. Particularly, let's take the example of a Christian church, there will also be reminders of how, you know, you shouldn't be selfish. You should think of other people. Think of how you can help those who can't help themselves. And that means that you're encouraged to join in to community activities where you, you know, all manner of things you could do, but you help out people in the community. So I think these aspects are really good in the secular world, in the scientific world. It tries to get community activities together, but it doesn't do as good a job, in my opinion. So that bit is the first thing I want to keep, because... Feeling socially connected is incredibly important for your health. The converse of that, if you feel socially isolated, it's really bad for your physical and mental health. And we've known this since 1988. This paper was published in Science. It says, the social relationships, or the relative lack thereof, constitute a major risk factor for health. So what that means is, if someone feels socially isolated, it's as bad for their health as things we know are bad for your health. Things like smoking, things like high, high blood pressure, things like uh, blood lipids, high cholesterol, uh, obesity, uh, low physical activity. All of these things predict bad health outcomes, and it turns out social isolation does the same thing. So I don't know what the stats are in, in, in Portugal, but in the UK, one in 10 people regularly experience loneliness. So this is a big problem in the world right now. If, if, if UK can be taken to be representative of, of the rest of Western Europe, at least. One in three people in Britain have a close friend or relative who feel lonely. And the consequences of this are that social isolation means a reduced life expectancy. You live a shorter life because things like cancer and heart disease get you sooner. And whilst you're still alive, your quality of life is degraded because socially isolated people have a higher incidence of uh, psychosis, personality disorders, and depression. So we really need to tackle social isolation. We need to do whatever we can to make our communities feel more connected. 
So this is where the seven deadly sins come in. Each of these things, in moderation, I would argue, they're very normal, everyday human behaviors exhibited all across the planet. And in moderation, in small amounts, they're good for us and they're good for our communities. But in the extreme, they have antisocial outcomes. In the extreme, that our behavior makes other people want to push us away. So what are the seven deadly sins? Well, I've, I got a friend to draw some demons. Each of these demons represents a different sin. So which sin is this? Feel free to shout out in Portuguese and then someone else will hopefully translate. Greed. greed. This is greed. So this is the demon of Mammon. A little bit of greed's okay because it means that you try and make a surplus. You try and generate a bit of spare cash in the bank account, for example which is helpful when something like a pandemic comes along, you know? Like if you lose your opportunity to make money for a period of time, then, you know, you can use that excess to help see you through the hard times. But in excess, greed causes lots of problems. For example, where do rich people live? They tend to live in segregated communities, cut off behind walls and barbed wire from other people because they get paranoid that other people want their money. A lot of the richest people in the world are also the most socially isolated people in the world. So what about this sin? Which one's this? Laziness or sloth. In a world of chronic overwork, uh, sometimes people aren't lazy enough. They need to relax. The body and brain needs time to recover from periods of intensive work. But in the extreme, laziness annoys other people. If people don't do their fair share of work, then they're going to become very unpopular. Why are you leaving us to do all the work? You need to do your fair share. Uh, what about this sin? Gluttony. Excellent. So gluttony comes from the Latin to gulp. It's all about putting excessive food and drink down your mouth. Back in the days of our ancestors, when we never knew where we were going to get our next meal, a little bit of gluttony was okay, because it means we can put fat under our skin. And when there's no food to eat, then we can cannibalize those fat deposits and survive. Whereas in this day and age, uh, you know, what was a, a design feature is now a design flaw because there's food everywhere, all the time, for most people in Western Europe at least. Um, the supermarkets don't run out of food, and so there is an excess of food. And, you know, if you think of it back in the old days, if you were to eat more than your fair share, that means someone else might, might not get to eat. Which is this sin? Jealousy? close but no cigar, it's envy. Jealousy is where you have something and you want to, you jealously guard it, you want to hold on to that thing and not let other people have it. Envy is where you see what other people have and it feels like they have more than you and it's better than you and it makes your own achievements feel smaller by comparison. Now there are two ways you can respond to em uh, envy. Envy, uh, benign envy, is where you see that that person from your background, similar background, similar start in life, they've got more, and you can compare yourself and think, how can I close the gap between them and me? And you can try and raise yourself up, perhaps get some extra training, perhaps move in different social circles so you can get the same opportunities. But then the extremes of envy also include malicious envy. There's another way to balance things out. You bring them crashing down. And envy is one of the worst in terms of causing antisocial outcomes because it can inspire people to do awful things to other people. I'm going to rattle through these because I'm running out of time. Then there's lust, and there's uh, wrath, anger, and then there's the queen of all the sins, according to Pope Gregory the Great. Pride. A little bit of pride is good for you. You should take pride in your work. You should be proud of yourself for a job well done. But in the extreme, pride is really bad. It means that you think you're more important than everyone else. You think you're better than everyone else. So Pope Gregory the Great in the 6th century AD is the guy who came up with the concept of seven deadly sins. And he was the one who thought that pride was the worst of all of them. Now seven deadly sins make sense because the Ten Commandments actually exceeds the capacity for human working memory. Human working memory can handle about seven items of information. Any more than that? And by the time you get to the eighth, ninth, tenth, the first, second, and third piece of information has fallen off the shelf. So he, he may not have realized this, but it was very helpful that he simplified matters because seven items of information most people can hold in mind simultaneously. But we're going to talk about pride. So I went through each of these seven deadly sins, and I looked at the pre-existing neuroscientific research relevant to each of these different human behaviors. And so 
Luckily for us, there's, well, luckily for me, um, the sin of pride is very, very close to narcissism. There are two types of narcissism. You can have, um, uh, you can have the uh, narcissistic personality disorder, MPD, which is a really severe psychiatric illness. But you also have a scale, the narcissistic personality inventory. And we all feature somewhere on this scale. It's 40, uh, a 40 question choice between two statements. And you just pick whichever statement fits you the best and you get a score out of it. So on the basis of getting uh, 40 different people to do this narcissistic personality inventory, uh, one fMRI study divided them into two groups, those high on the narcissism scale and those low on the narcissism scale, and looked at the brain activations that happened when the person was socially rejected. And what they found was that this area, the DACC, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, was more active in the narcissistic people's brains at the moment of social rejection. So what does that mean? Well, the DACC is a part of the pain matrix. So anytime we feel pain, whether it's a paper cut on the finger or a stubbed toe, it causes the pain matrix to light up and the pain matrix creates the sense of pain. And the DACC is a part of it. It also comes up in terms of psychological turmoil, when you feel when you feel psychological pain, when you feel distressed by something that's happened to you socially, for example, this same brain area lights up. And so social pain seems to be experienced more acutely in the brains of narcissists than in the brains of non-narcissists. And I think this is very interesting. So I went through all the evidence of all the different sins, and I found the same brain area came up when people were feeling envious in studies of envy. This same brain area came up in studies of greed, where two people have to split a pot, and when one person proposes an unfair split of 100 euros, let's say person A says, let's split this 50-50, person B says, okay, yeah, I'll do that, I'll allow this deal to go through. But if, you start propo if person A proposes 70-30, then person B will say, no, 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 that's really unfair. You want double the amount of money that I'm gonna get? I'd rather both of us got nothing, which is irrational because 30 euros is still free money, but humans really don't like it because this part of the brain lights up. You feel social pain when someone behaves unfairly towards you. And then in terms of Roth, there's this amazing experiment that psychologists invented called the Taylor aggression paradigm. Person A and person B again. They're both wired up to electrodes. There's a dial. So person A can electrocute person B, and then when person B goes, ow, that really hurt, they can turn up the voltage to zap them back harder. And the person being like, ow, that was much harder than I zapped you. Crank it up even higher, zap them back again. So what they found in this experiment was that the DACC lit up in a manner proportional to the amount of revenge they wanted. So if they turned it up a little bit, it lit up quite weakly. If they turned it up a lot, it lit up very, very strongly. So here's four examples out of the seven, four examples out of the seven of this brain area being very much involved in generating these antisocial behaviors. It was also in a meta-analysis of people's responses to pornography, one of the top three most consistent areas that lit up, but I had to discount it for technical reasons. So, keep an eye on this chap. Oh, you can't hear it. You're not a neurologist, you're a bleep, 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 idiot. So this guy, was, um, he was hurling abuse at me all the way through this talk. And I thought, when I look back at this footage, what an amazing example of social isolation. How, I mean, he was, this is 11 in the morning, he's incredibly drunk, so that's gluttony, and he was incredibly angry. He goes down there every weekend to abuse these people talking about religions. And look at how much space he creates around him. Over here, a dense crowd. Over here, nothing, because people literally move away from him. Wherever he went, people moved away. So the takeaway is this. Religions are really good at building communities, and we should keep hold of that. There's a really nice quote about um, wars between nations. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but the ability to cope with it. The other insight from this is that um, peace of mind is not the absence of inner conflict, but the ability to manage it. 
Buddha has been said, you know, t said two and a half thousand years ago that suffering is inevitable. You know, this DACC area is not new. We've always had it, and it's always generated a certain amount of suffering. But when you have interactions with people who are being really antisocial, who religious-minded people might say are in the grips of one of the seven deadly sins, rather than getting angry at them back, rather than letting them frustrate you, it makes sense to, you know, think of, think of Jesus, you know, be compassionate about the inner pain they're experiencing. If you think about the DACC, what's, you know, the amount of suffering that person must be enduring to make them behave in such an antisocial way, it can actually make it much easier for you to deal with them. And so that guy who I, who I actually shouted at the first time, when I came back to talk a few months later, um, I explained to the crowd that I hadn't dealt with it very well, I hadn't put my own my own words into practice. And he, you know, he only turned up halfway through. And I'd explained that I'd disappointed myself. I was quite ashamed that I tried to ignore him. I tried to make other people sort of laugh at him. I tried to tell him to get out of town. And when I saw him arrive up the bat, I literally, I, I jumped off the stage. I said, this is the guy I was talking to you about. I went over to him. I apologized. I said, I'm so sorry that I treated you so horribly last time. And without even really thinking about it, I put my arms around him, gave him a hug. And then I realized what I'd done and thought, he might be mentally ill, like he might stab me. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And then he actually just, he just relaxed into my arms. It was really strange. He, he was completely like, he was a kitten. He was absolutely fine. He caused me no trouble. And I chatted to him later, and it turns out he'd been living homeless for five or six years. And he said, now that I listen to you, I actually agree with what you say. Okay, so I'm, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I converted him. And it's absolutely true. So look, I've run out of time. I don't quite know how that happened. I thought I had 50 minutes, and I think I only had 40. Ah, I've got 10 minutes left. The other guy started late. Okay, I'm not going to rush this. I'm going to give you my last two bops. So this is relevant to managing inner conflict, right? Who meditates? One person, two person, three person, four, a few people. Okay, good, good. So I was the kind of person, might, might be people like this in the audience, who are like, you know what, meditation, it sounds great, but it's not for me. That's for new age hippies. That's for more open-minded people. I'm too conservative for that nonsense. I don't have time. I can't concentrate. But then when I read this paper, which came out a couple of years ago, it's a meta-analysis of 20 years worth of uh, neuroscience experiments trying to work out, does meditation actually work? And they concluded that it exerts a beneficial effect on your physical health, your mental health, and your cognitive performance. So in terms of reducing the levels of activity in the DACC, in terms of reducing our own mental suffering on a daily basis, the benefit of mindfulness is simple. You know, people talk about being present, and it's like, but what does being present actually mean? It's simply the absence of allowing yourself to, what, to think in the past or think in the future. Worrying things, you know, when you look back in, into the past, you tend to focus on the things that worry you, on the things that upset you, on the interactions with people that you know, cause you anxiety. When you think of the future, which is by definition uncertain, there are lots of things that can worry you. But if you're in the present moment, you're not thinking about the, present, the past or the future by definition. And so you can reduce the activation in the DACC. And the more you do it, if you do it daily, you can do this more and more effectively and the very latest research shows that you actually physically change the structure of your brain. So if you do it daily, after four weeks, you can improve your attention. You can focus on something for longer than you could before you started meditating. After eight weeks, there are measurable changes in the white matter in brain areas to do with meta-analysis, so thinking about what you're thinking about, just objectively looking into your mind. And then after 10 weeks, you can see changes in the gray matter. So as with all things, neuroplasticity, it physically changes your brain in a way that reduces your DACC activations, and that reduces the cortisol release from your adrenal glands. So stress comes from the hormone cortisol, and by meditating, you can reduce the release of stress hormone. It's amazing. It really is amazing. So it's not just for hippies. And here's my final BOP, my final brain optimization principle. There are three things that you should not do within 60 minutes of wanting to put your head on the table. So let's say you notice it's 10 o'clock, head on the table, head on the pillow. You want to go to sleep at 11. After 10, do not do the following things. Do not have a gigantic meal. 
do not do intensive exercise. I know they don't look like they're doing intensive exercise, but imagine they are. Do not have a really hot bath or a really hot shower. Why? What unites those three things? Okay, I'll give you a clue. This is the, this is the antithesis. This is the opposite side of the story. Why do we do this? We do it, other mammals do it, old and young mammals do it, and you're doing it now because it's catching. Yawning is contagious. Why do we yawn? Well, I'll tell you because I'm running out of time. When you yawn, you pull in room temperature air down your throat, which by definition is cooler than the 37 degree blood traveling up your carotids. It's to cool your brain. Your brain needs to cool by one degree centigrade before you can properly get off to sleep. So the reason you don't have a big meal is because if you're still digesting a big meal when you're trying to get to sleep, the enzymes breaking down those food molecules will release heat, adding heat to the equation when you should be reducing your temperature. If you've done some really you know, intensive exercise, your muscles will still be giving off heat for a certain period of time, raising your temperature levels when you need to be lowering your brain temperature levels. And then finally, having a really hot bath, having a really hot shower, you're adding heat to the, to the system rather than releasing it. And so now, any of you who, when you sleep, you poke your feet out the bottom of the bedclothes, yeah? The reason you have that instinct is because uh, your blood vessels dilate in your hands and your feet in order to help you lose heat. So now you know. Okay, thank you very much uh, for allowing me the extra time. No one threw me off. Um, I, I tweet regularly at Dr. Jack Lewis. Uh, I blog monthly, and I've been doing it for 10 years, at drjack.co.uk. That's my first book. The second edition came out last month. That's my second book. It's not very good. Don't buy it. And that's my third book, uh, which has been translated into Portuguese and is available next door. And I'm going to wander over there in case any of you want me to sign it. So thank you very much for your attention, and all the best. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Poeiras, 46 km quadrados de ideias e emoções com que damos forma ao futuro. Oeiras 27.